Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Spath, <clears throat> and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. I'm also a member of the Palestine Israel Network of the United Church of Christ and a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition. It's so good to see so many of Don's friends on here. And many of you I know too, but uh, I'm, I'm cognizant, Don, and I know them through you. Although I read the memoir, at least uh, draft one or whatever draft this is, and I've got a number of questions for you, Don. We're delighted today that our friend Don Wagner has returned for part two of a conversation about his coming memoir, Glory to God in the Lowest, Journey to an Unholy Land. You can find part one of the interview with Don on our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace YouTube channel. And this interview will be posted there too in a couple of days. So check, check that out. If you'd like to use them or send them along to friends who couldn't make it today, again, go to our YouTube channel in a couple of days and both of them will be there. So Don, welcome back. Well, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Indiana Center, for the great work you're doing. And uh, I thank everyone for being on. It's kind of humbling and kind of awesome to see friends as you come on the screen. And uh, just thanks for taking the time this afternoon. Uh, I want to get to the memoir, Don, uh, but I had a number of emails from folks asking, uh, when are you going to finish the darn thing? And when will it be available? And how can people get it? Yeah, I'm asking myself that. I uh, I've still got to finish a draft of the last chapter, and then I've got to start working through the entire manuscript to tighten it up before I try to get it published. So I'm still in that stage, but I think maybe by the end of March, I'll try to reach out and find a publisher or self-publish. You know, I started this thinking it would just be for the kids and the grandkids, and um, then I thought, well, let's make it a little wider. So if it's just uh, some of you friends out there, uh, we'll get it done, and I hope maybe by the end of the fall or by Christmas, we can have it in print, but Good. that's a hope. Good. Well, I it, I can just tell you, Don, on behalf of many of your friends here who have known you much longer than I have, I've known you for 15 years. Some of these folks go back decades with you. Uh, we're excited for the final product, and so please uh, keep that in mind and keep us all in mind. <clears throat> Don, you're, you're known as a scholar activist on Palestine Israel, but from the start, you had an interest in and traveled throughout the broader Middle East, Lebanon, Jordan, and others. I especially appreciated in your memoir, your discussion of your early travels in Damascus and Syria in the 1980s, chapter 18 specifically. There's so much to ask here, Don, but I'd be interested in you sharing with us a little bit about the Christians of Syria and your take on U.S. policy towards Syria as it's evolved over the years. Well, well, um, you know, I haven't been in Syria probably in 10 years. And uh, I was there in the late 70s and early 80s. And then again in 86. And uh, the Christians were telling us we've never had it so good. Uh, we can have our worships on television, but we have to watch ourselves what we say about the regime. So that was, that was very true. But then now what has happened with how Syria has imploded has just been, you know, just a tragedy beyond tragedies. And nobody knows what's going to be left of Syria. And I remember um, Ray Baki an evangelical friend and I had a meeting with Patriarch Ignatius IV. This was in 86. And one of the things he said to us is we're concerned about some of the Islamic extremists. And he said, I, I don't mean we love the Muslims, we love the Islamic religion, we're brothers and sisters together, but some of these extremists really have it in for us. And I'm worried that we may be the last generation of Christians in Syria. And uh, that may well be the case, it may well not, but 
Uh, my friend Pauline Kaufman and others are very close to that. I'm not an expert on this issue. So I don't know how, the, how Christianity will survive. I'm, I'm sure it will in some form. And I hope Syria can somehow reunite. But again, it, it's totally unknown. You, you bring up Ray Baki in 1986, that trip. Uh, I, that was the next question I wanted to ask you. <clears throat> you remember that I, I used to work for His Royal Highness Prince Hassan uh, bin Talal, uh, King Hussein's brother at the Royal Institute for Interfaith Studies uh, when I was a Fulbright scholar there in 98, 99. But you and Ray Baki were uh, 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 in Jordan in 1986 and you, you met King Hussein. And you, rep you report a, a pleasant conversation you had with him, but then as you put it, and, and I'll just quote here, he brought his chair forward and with urgency, he addressed us. So say a word about uh, uh, your impressions of King Hussein and what he said to you and what you learned that day about the about interreligious dynamics uh, in the region. Yeah, well, Ray and I were there um, this was his idea to do a listening trip around the Middle East of where we could go. We couldn't, we weren't able to get into Lebanon because it was, uh, the civil war was raging, but we did visit Syria, Jordan, Israel, Palestine, Cyprus, Egypt. And those were our foci. And we were asking what are the major issues facing political leaders and relig religious leaders? Uh, in, in the region. We did an interview on Christian Zionism that was aired on Jordan television. And the host said, you need to meet with the king. He's concerned about this. So we got in, uh, and this was the director of the Middle East Council of Churches in Jordan who got us in. So we had that interview with the king. And toward the end of it, he pulled out, he got the Jerusalem Post every day from the bridge l &B Bridge, and he pulled out an issue, and the Christian, the International Christian Embassy was having its annual Feast of Tabernacles that day, that week. And he said, these are the people who are causing so much trouble for us. And he said, we are concerned that some of the more extreme uh, Islamists are going to react negatively to this extreme form of Zionism. He said, and if they do, uh, the Christians might be pushed out of, the, of, of our countries and we moderate Muslims will be right behind them. So he was raising this issue. Uh, and again, you know, being a Muslim, that's not a Islamophobic comment. It's a concern about the Islamists. Uh, so it was in that context that he raised that. But he, but he was very... Uh, very affirming of the work we were doing, the critique of Christian Zionism at that time, and to create an evangelical organization that would break, create a dialogue be between the historic Middle East churches, Islam, and, uh, and Western evangelicals. You're going to notice here, thanks, Don, you're going to notice here that we're going to kind of move through uh, the memoir pretty quickly like we did last time. So it may seem you were jumping around a little bit, but uh, I'm kind of wanting to, to pick and choose and move through the topics. Um, like you, Don, and so many of the people on, on the call today, although you, you knew him much earlier than I did, a number of us have gotten to know Mordecai Vanunu over the years. Uh, I first met him at St. George's Anglican Cathedral, then caught back up with him at Lutheran Church of the Redeemer. Say a word about him, um, your knowledge of him, what lessons you learned from his activism for your own. Yeah, well, on that same trip, Ray and I left Jordan and arrived in Jerusalem and walked into our hotel. And all the news was about Venunu had been captured by Mossad. Uh, he had released the photos that he had taken of Demona, the nuclear reactor that exposed uh, Israel's nuclear program. Um, and he had been captured, uh, at, I think, a day before we arrived there. His priest from uh, Sydney 
Mordecai, by the way, he, he left Israel, was on a vacation, traveled through India, made his way down to Australia. And when he was in Australia, he was sitting on all these photographs of Demona, didn't know what to do with them. One day he's walking by a church and he sees on the uh, marquee out in front of the church, uh, a midweek series following Jesus in places of great conflict. So he started attending this and he got to know the pastor, Reverend John McKnight, and uh, he eventually converted Christianity, Mordecai did, through the ministry of McKnight. And then he resolved that I've got to do something with this. And it was an act of faith and great risk where they made a deal with the London Sunday Times to publish it. So it's huh. all exposed. So Mordecai was then uh, captured on a boat by Mossad on a trip somewhere, I think to Italy. And they drugged him and uh, he was uh, he was in captivity and about to not put on trial. So his, his priest, Father McKnight, traveled to Jerusalem to ask for asylum for Mordecai, that he'd be released to Australia or Norway. He had a deal either way. And of course, the Israelis could care less. So then McKnight was trying to organize a press conference. So Ray and I helped him and uh, had a press conference appealing for Mordecai's release. And of course, Mordecai spent 18 years right. in prison, much of it in isolation. So I met him after that at St. George's. And the last time Linda and I saw him was two years ago, was it? Uh, in December. And we offered to take him to lunch. He said, no, I'm under strict surveillance. I can't do it. Right. So I don't know how things are now. I understand he's moved to Jaffa probably still under strict surveillance, unable to travel outside the country. But, uh, you know, it was really an act of faith and justice to take that risk uh, with an enormous price to be paid. The last time I saw him was about two years ago on Ash Wednesday at, at, Redeemer. Yeah. at Redeemer. Yeah. Yeah, he's at, worshiping at Redeemer now, I think. <clears throat> This question is going to prompt you a bit, Don, but uh, just bear with me. Uh, you, I, I, I think you do a wonderful job in your memoir documenting your awakening and activism as it paralleled the rise of evangelical Christianity as a powerful political force in our country. Uh, so thank you for that. Palestine Human Rights Campaign in Chicago with Pauline and others, then Evangelicals from Middle East Understanding, you say that the relationship, you say that the relationship was seamless between the, that's the word you used, between the religious right and secular neoconservatism seen in Reagan's foreign policy in Latin America, you know, the, the Contras and trying to overthrow the Sandinistas, uh, opposing Marxist forces in Eastern Europe and Middle East foreign policy. And then you re reference the early part of this century, it continued with the project for a new American century and the continued influence of Christian Zionism in Congress. So I, I know there's a lot there, Don, but can you share with us some of the lessons that you've drawn from this marriage between the religious and political right over the last 30, 40 years in our country? Well, yeah, I know. I'll give it a try. <laughs> Well, you can see in the late 70s, as the religious right was rising and moved really from the Democrats in the South to the Republican Party, uh, they really were involved in helping an evangelical get elected, Jimmy Carter. But then Carter was not their kind of evangelical, so they revolted against him. I remember um, Landrum Bowling, a dear friend who many of us know, uh, he was an advisor to Carter. And Carter gave a speech in March, would it be 77, in New Hampshire, where he said, we support uh, the Palestinians' right to a homeland. He didn't even say state. Oh, wow. And Landrum had a hand writing that speech, and he said that was not in the speech. Carter ad-libbed that. 
on his feet. Right away, there was an alliance between the major Zionist organizations and the religious right. Full page ads came out from the Boston Globe, New York Times. I still have a copy from the Chicago Sun-Times and Tribune. Evangelicals oppose Carter's uh, move against the Bible. And then they quote Genesis 12, 3. Of course they And the did. covenant. <laughs> and the cov so <laughs> Carter now was going against the Bible. And that was really a sign of the alliance between the pro-Israel Jewish lobby and the rising moral majority, 700 Club, Pat Boone and the rest. So I could see that. And that's when I decided I was gonna do my doctoral dissertation on the rise of the religious right. Then Reagan comes into power and uh, the neocons were really, I think, running foreign policy at that point under Reagan. But the religious right played a major role in his administration. Reagan held uh, briefings in the White House annually, bringing in the religious right, not just Falwell, but some of the up and rising young stars. And Grace Halsell, who was a writer that some of us remember, she infiltrated and attended one of those and gave me the program and we discussed it. So Reagan was mobilizing that and they would have briefings by uh, Oliver North. And it was, you know, the whole Contra exchange and the need for evangelicals to support Reagan's uh, use of the Contras against the Sandinistas, against El Salvador and all that, that came up. So that alliance was really in place under Reagan. And uh, Reagan himself, uh, he was converted while he was very sick in the hospital to end time theology, Armageddon theology, and was a true believer. And he made references occasionally in speeches. So this alliance was there uh, in the Reagan administration and it just has built ever since and then it reached its zenith under Trump. But to see the political dimension of Christian Zionism rising and playing this role and the negative impact it had on the Middle East, on Palestine, but also on Middle Eastern Christianity are among the key things that uh, uh, you know, made it a, a, a centerpiece for me. Is the antidote a uh, foreign policy based in human rights or what other, kind of, what other kind of language would you use that would be an antidote to such a, uh, uh, an unholy marriage between theology and politics on the right? Well, I think there's several. I think, I think um, yeah, we have to get back to international law and we can show the alliance through our theology I think liberation theology is the antidote, but many evangelicals cannot embrace it, even though it's Jesus-centered and justice-centered. So I think it can be revised, repackaged in a biblical kind of evangelical theology. And you see this coming out of Sojourners, uh, Brian McLaren, and a number of young evangelicals. So, uh, but I, I mean, for evangelicals, it's a different language, different thought form. And, uh, you know, our, our group that's doing um, www.christianzionism.org, they're doing a good job on this. Uh, so you can consult that to see how it's reframed. But uh, there, there are many young evangelicals reframing it. But I think it has to be anchored in international law, human rights, and justice to the marginalized, dispossessed and claim Jesus at the center of it. You begin uh, really a pivotal chapter uh, in your memoir. You begin very, very brusquely and you say, everything changed in the Middle East on December 9th, 1987. Um, and you show how the, the seeds of the, the first intifada were now shooting forth uh, you were in your new home in Cyprus at the time, and then you headed to Jerusalem to help out the Middle East Council of Churches. And it was during this trip that you heard Naim Atik preach. So, Don, I've got two parts to this question. Um, 
fill us in from your firsthand perspective about the first intifada, because you were on the ground. Uh, maybe some things we don't know, uh, particularly talk to us about the role of women in the first intifada, because because you referenced that. Then the second one, and, and so keep these two, you know, keep these two uh, answers separate if you can. Talk to us about your encounter with Naeem Atik. Um, and you say that you returned to your roots in liberation theology when you met Naeem. So those two questions. Okay, cut me off because this could get long. <laughs> well, each one of these questions is pretty packed. Yeah. I know. Well, uh, I was kind of burning out with the uh, Palestine Human Rights Campaign. <clears throat> so I worked out a sabbatical and took the family over. And Cyprus was a marvelous place. I was going to write a book and uh, had all that background prepared. The kids were young. And uh, so we would often turn on the television and you could pull in Lebanon TV from Turkey. And this was before cable, uh, before the weather turned cold. <laughs> so I remember watching, um, uh, I think it was Jordan television and the news where uh, Arafat arrived with his entourage for the Arab summit in Amman. And this was in November and nobody went to meet him, which is an insult. And it showed how the Palestinian agenda had dropped down to the bottom uh, at the, in the Arab world, at least with the leadership. Then two weeks later, the Intifada breaks out. And I was, a, I was just a 45 minute plane ride away in mm. Cyprus. So I talked to the family. They said, if you can be home for Christmas and bring us presents, you can go. <laughs> so I took off. It may have been Kathy Bergen or Jan Obushakra who met me. And by that time, Palestine Human Rights Information Center was at work with 10 field workers deployed all over the West Bank and Gaza. And we had an arrangement through Palestine Human Rights Campaign and Louise Kankar, where from Chicago, we would distribute the human rights reports to the media, to human rights offices, the governments and so on. So I arrived, Jan and Samir Abu Shaka briefed me on what was going on. And they said, you know, you got to get out there and see this. So I did. And uh, I spent three days in Gaza with our field worker, Walid there. And I remember he drove me around when he picked me up at the, uh, at the entrance to Gaza. And uh, you could see the kids, 250, 300 demonstrators burning tires the Israeli army comes by and they pelt them with rocks and then disappear into the alleys. And it was just electric and alive. And you saw young people, Shabab, on bikes orchestrating and running this thing. It was unbelievable. We drove by a mosque and they said, hey, there's no Israelis at this place. And there is a small demonstration and Walid said, well, this is a new Islamic organization called Hamas. And we think the Israelis are treating them with kid gloves to try to split Muslims off from the PLO in Gaza. But we'll have to watch this. We don't know where it's going. So you oh. saw that there. Uh, but it was just wild, electric. I come back to Jerusalem and the field workers took me around and... Uh, the women's organizations, then Anash al Usra with Um Khalil, who, who hated Arafat and ran against him for president later. Uh, Anash al Usra was organizing the women, uh, schooling in homes with medical relief committees. Mustafa Barghouti and uh, his relief committees were doing amazing right. work out in the villages that had to take care of themselves as they protested. And this was a grassroots movement from the bottom up with underground leadership, like nothing we had seen. And the PLO actually had to catch up with it. And the Israelis were constantly trying to figure out who's running this thing. And I think they moved the leadership around cleverly from place to place. Every morning you get up 
and a bayan, which was kind of an order. Every three days, I think, was slipped under the front door or on the windshield of your car. Here's when the uh, businesses must close, and they rotated it different times from Jerusalem to Ramallah to Bethlehem and so on. And uh, your demonstrations will happen in the streets. Here are the martyrs. They would list the martyrs who had been killed, uh, the holidays. So it was all orchestrated and run from the grassroots, bottom up. Women played a huge role, but uh, the community was organized. Young people were engaged and they paid a heavy price with Rabin's break their bones strategy. Uh, I even remember going down to Jericho and we saw uh, some of the Palestinian leaders in, in Jericho pulling people out when the Israeli army tried to bury them alive. Things like that were going on. So you see all this, the pain, the suffering, but the mobilization of the society uh, was, was just miraculous. Then the second part, uh, so I come back just a couple days to go on my 10 day trip and uh, I go to worship at St. George's Cathedral and Naeem Atik is preaching. And uh, I had heard about Naeem but had never met him face to face. And I heard a amazing sermon on justice and solidarity with the suffering of the uprising and steadfastness. And after worship, Naeem and Jonathan Kutab had a dialogue about the text and they filled the room with, uh, with people. CPT, Christian Peacemaker teams, drove up, reported what was going on at Hebron. Mothers and fathers talked about their son who was picked up last week and was in prison. Jonathan offers, what do you need in terms of legal aid? And uh, you hear what's going on from the people, but then you discuss the text. Mm -hmm. And the liberation theology was being born right out of the pulpit to the pew and in these dialogues. And that was, it wasn't the beginning, but it was the latest incarnation of liberation theology. And eventually it becomes uh, Sabil. You connect that, Don, in your memoir with your academic study years earlier in liberation theology, which we talked yes. about last time, but also, and make this connection for us now, also your experience as uh, uh, your, your, your first associate, uh, assistant minister uh, uh, role in an African-American congregation, black theology, black church experience, liberation theology, now connected to Palestinian liberation theology with Naeem. Okay. Um, well, my introduction to liberation theology was a course in seminary I mentioned last week with Professor yeah. Shaw, who blew me away, and I had to go through almost therapy to figure out how I transitioned from evangelicalism and my, uh, my upbringing to liberation theology, and then I was marching uh, against the war and then civil rights. So my first church uh, was a black church in Newark. And the pastor, Joe Roberts, went on to uh, Pastor Ebenezer Baptist. And in Joe's preaching, the black uh, theologian he talked about the most was Howard Thurman, who was a black mystic and liberation theolo theologian. So I got his book, Jesus and the Disinherited, which I continue to pull out today. Oh my gosh, yeah. Which For makes sure. all the connections. And I needed the personal spiritual but then with the justice piece. And the black church does this uh, most in most cases. I just read Reverend Warnock's book, uh, which is pulling all these themes together, the struggle in the black church between <clears throat> the personal gospel of salvation and liberation theology. So I got that in that experience in the black church. Um, and then I was kind of, a, it was always there and I kind of drifted away from it a bit. And then I became part of a house church, a radical house church in Evanston, as I was transitioning out of the pastorate at First, Pre First Presbyterian Evanston. And Bud Ogle was kind of our guru and leader. 
And we got involved in local ministries, in tax resistance, in all kinds of things. And liberation theology was coming alive then. And, uh, and then I get involved in Palestine. And with Naima Teek's uh, preaching, I go back now and put it all together and never left it. I'm going to fast forward now, Don, a bit. Um, there's so much we could discuss about your years at North Park University. Um, uh, you're the Middle East Study Center, uh, relationship with Sabeel, my gosh, Pauline Kaufman, Bob Hostetter, Steve Haas, Robert Fisk, et cetera. But selfishly, um, because this is when we met in 2005, when I called you out of the blue and we had lunch together at the Kroner, you invited me to a conference you held in April 2005, Israel, the Bible, and, fut and the future, premillennialism and Christian Zionism in America. Um, you did something bold there, really. Uh, I'm not sure I would have done it. Uh, <clears throat> in addition to Timothy Weber and Stephen Sizer, Gary Burge, and others, you invited your buddy, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, Rabbi Yechiel Pupko of the Jewish Federation of Chicago, who was instrumental in your dismissal years later. And, and I remember in your memoir, I see Tom Getman on the, uh, on the yeah, call yeah. here. Pupko and Tom had a conversation that was uh, years later about your dismissal and how Pupko was in, uh, uh, instrumental in that. But so there's all, you know, all this stuff happening. And I just recall that that memory of you and me meeting during that time. But here's the part I want you to focus on. You write, in all this turmoil and hubbub at North Park, the spiritual disciplines of prayer and meditation provided solace. I started each day sitting by my garden with Miles Davis Wagner at my side the meditation and prayer time were my lifeline and anchor. So, Don, I know there's a lot there, but where would you like to where would you like to reflect for us? Oh boy. <laughs> well, I think um, let me just jump to this. Was after I was unceremoniously dismissed. But you you had won the Teacher of the Year award, or Teaching Excellence Award well, that year too. That doesn't matter. <laughs> 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 I know. Yeah. So this was after I was dismissed, my job is finished. And uh, I was angry as hell for months and even had uh, a, uh, lit a lawyer to litigate and fight North Park uh, to reinstate me. And I just got to the point where I figured, you know, I, I have to get rid of this anger and I don't want to be trapped and consumed in it. The attorney said, look, my fee is $6.50 an hour. Uh, I think you've got a strong case. But the university could delay this a couple of years and bankrupt you. Do you have those kind of resources? Yeah, hell no. I was barely making my mortgage payment. So uh, I had to move on and let go of that anger. So what I did was I just started to go to the backyard. Miles Davis Wagner, who, by the way, is not my son. He was my dog. <laughs> and he would sit there. I would have a cup of coffee and I would sit and meditate by the garden and breathe in God and breathe out the anger. And it took a couple months, but gradually it was released. And, uh, and that is a discipline that then I never stopped. I start every day that way to this day. And it is the lifeline. You know, it, it centers me. Some days are stronger than others, but uh, yeah. And you see your values, you reflect, and you uh, get back on course. So yeah, that's what I was doing. So eventually, I let go of that anger, and uh, and uh, every now and then it would bubble up, and then you get back. No, you got to stay the course, and and so on. So yeah, that that's what that process was all about. You know, uh, those of us who know you know that that these are inextricably linked together inside of you. A deep spiritual faith as well as your activism. One doesn't exist without the other in you. 
Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I think it, it came together more <laughs> in later years. And I look back and wished, you know, it was like uh, in the earlier years, remember Malcolm Boyd, are you running with me, Jesus? <laughs> You know, that was my prayer life, you know, often in the early days. And then you have kids that have to get things done and uh, take time with your spouse. And often that didn't even happen. So uh, I think it was later in life toward those North Park years and then the dismissal that really solidified me. I, I think I'm a slow learner at times on some of these things. But uh, once it was there and I saw the value you know, it just became a daily part of my regimen. And, you know, something's wrong when I don't do it. We talked earlier before everybody came on and you shared with me about Miles Davis Wagner and how close you were with Miles. In fact, you and Linda, you had an agreement that uh, you would move to the suburbs. Uh, and that was what you gave, but Linda had to give too. She had to accept Miles. Yeah. <laughs> tell, tell us... Uh, and you share with me about uh, what happened with Miles just a few months ago. You want to just, for those of us who know you. Yeah. Well, time for the dog. Uh, yeah. Miles lived to be 15 years and three months. But uh, a little before that, Linda and I fell in love. And um, I had to sell my house and, and, and dump that because I couldn't really manage it all. And uh, she said, well, why don't you move in with me? My house is paid for. And let's see how our relationship develops. Now, I know my Arab students, the women, I would take Miles to my office and they were afraid of him. You know, he was like a big wolf. He was a, <laughs> he was a Malamute, uh, <laughs> kind of a husky type. But uh Arab women, some of them have problems with dogs. Here's Linda, who was a cat person and very peaceful, saying, <laughs> okay, I'll try to work with Miles and figure this out. So let's move in and figure out a relationship. Well, she was True just- True love, Don, true love. It was, it was really, that was a test. I'm bad <laughs> enough. But me and the Husky were a double problem. So with all the fur, I-, I, I uh, so that was wonderful. <laughs> Miles died just this past July. And uh, no, he was really very, very special. He, he had many human qualities. Richard Rohr talks, talks about this with his dog, often seeing the eye of God in your dog and the dog's peace. During this time too, Don, um, um, there was a lot of pressure on you and your center from university uh, administration. I didn't know this, uh, but you said uh, uh, there was pl pressure placed on many of our mutual friend, uh, Brant Rosen, to not, to not uh, join your board when you invited him. Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> we always had a rabbi on our board of directors, and um, Herb Bronstein was... Um, getting up in years and he said, I can't do it anymore. So we need another rabbi. And I was taking my world religions class to Brandt synagogue. I was just so impressed with his preaching, the whole experience at the Jewish Reconstructionist Center in Evanston. So I asked Brandt, hey, would you join our board? We really need a rabbi. Your sense of justice really fits for us. And, uh, it was interesting because we had a professor on our board who was we were suspicious of, and uh, and it was kind of a test in a way, where uh, our board embraced and adopted that we would give an invitation to Brant Rosen to join us, and that was a Monday night. The next morning, Brant calls me and said, uh, "I've had a call from the board of rabbis saying." if you join that board, you're gonna have trouble in your congregation. And he said, I better not do that. And there's only one person that could have done that. So that showed the connection uh, of that professor. I called him out on it and he denied it. But yeah, so Brent said no, but uh, you know, that was just kind of a uh, he's you know, been, unfortunate uh, incident. And uh, yeah, that's the kind of pressure, that's how it works. 
It's time for you to give a commercial, I think, Don, because during this time, uh, something uh, was created that lasts to this very day that came out of that conference in April 2005, and that's a Christian Zionism uh, website. You want to say a word about that and refer people to it? Uh, because it's still active today, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, at the end of that conference, I pulled together the speakers and our board and a few others and uh, said, you know, we have to do something that's ongoing. It's fine to have conferences and speakers, um, but what if we created like a website? And uh, Steven Sizer was there and I knew he was really good on technology. I still am not. And I said, here's my credit card. See if we can get christianzionism.org and start a website. He comes back 10 minutes later, say, done. Here's your card, 50 bucks. <laughs> so we got the name christianzionism.org and uh, it was under our Center for Middle Eastern uh, uh, Middle Eastern Studies at North Park. And then the Jewish Federation put pressure on North Park and we had to let go of it under pressure. They didn't like it. So the president caved in and went along with that under protest from us. And uh, John Hubers took it over and did a marvelous job with it for several years. And about three years ago, John said, you know, I can't manage it anymore. So we pulled together another group, an incognito group of mostly evangelicals who are still carrying on that work. So I urge you, it's evangelicals and others drafting and putting up in the news things. Theology has got a whole section interpreting the Bible. And uh, it's now in Spanish and soon will be in Portuguese and maybe other languages as well. It's a, it's a great resource. Christian Zionism. www.christianzionism.org. I want to take this moment, Don, to give a shout out to the uh, Israel-Palestine a mission network of the Presbyterian Church USA. Uh, you have been involved with them, uh, Nusheen, uh, uh, Pauline, and so many others. Uh, uh, Jewish, along with the IPMN, uh, uh, with partners with Jewish Voice for Peace, Mark Braverman, and Palestinian friends like Rifat Cassis, you all were instrumental in moving the PCUSA to adopt resolutions supporting boycott, divestment, and sanctions, as well as against the incarceration and maltreatment of children in no way to treat a child. Uh, I'm a member of the UCC PIN, and I see Gay Harder here. She was one of the founders of UCC PIN. Uh, I was at those original meetings, but Gay was really one of the driving forces yeah. for that. But the Presbyterians really um, uh, were models uh, for other denominations. What, what are the lessons that you've learned in, in your church activism uh, that you can share with the rest of us? Well, I think some others like Pauline Nusheen and many others who are on this call could do a better job than me. Well, it, yeah. But I would say, man, patience, steadfastness, and don't keep your eye on the ball. It took 10 years of IPMN and many others in the MRTI, the mission, you know, our, uh, our accountability uh, investment firm under Bill Somplansky German to guide that through 10 years. And uh, every two years we would face off in, in the committee to debate the, uh, the divestment resolution, which was really uh, in, you know, responsible investment is what it really came down to. It's an act of Christian stewardship. But we would line up and we, we would have three minutes or two minutes to give you a little speech. And you have the Simon Wiesenthal Center and Zionist lobbies opposing you. And then the committee would decide. And usually the committee would move it to the floor where it would be defeated then, often by a close vote. But in Detroit in 2014, um, and others were masters at this, David Jones and Jeff Dio, Nusheen and Pauline, it passed by three votes. So we celebrated and 
June 2014, where it finally was adopted. And then, uh, you know, yeah, many other denominations have gone and done likewise. And uh, it still comes under fire. <laughs> and I, uh, you know, we, we still have a long way to go. But it has been, uh, I, I think, for the churches to embrace a controversial piece like this with a long history through civil rights, uh, South Africa and many others, uh, it's protected free speech, it's nonviolent, and uh, to stay the course, be patient, and not to surrender to the pressure are, are the key lessons, I think. You know, Don, you, you reference these in your book, uh, or in your memoir, you know, we who stand in solidarity with our Palestinian friends look to them for leadership uh, and their theological and political analysis. I'm gonna mention three that are central to me that you refer to in your book. And I'd like for you to talk about them, but also add any others that you'd like to uh, for reference. My three are the, the launch of the BDS movement in 2005, the 2009 Kairos Palestine document and the Kairos USA response, and last year's cry for hope, a call for decisive action. You want to say a word about you know any or all of those or or any that you would add that maybe are just so necessary resource material that come from our Palestinian friends who really are our leaders in this struggle. Yeah, I think you've named them, Mike. Um, and uh, there were some that preceded that. I think the work of uh, Cairo's Palestine is absolutely essential. And, uh, and now as a global phenomenon around the world, uh, you know, Mark Braverman has done a wonderful job and look to Palestine portal for some of the work that's going on in Europe uh, with Kairos Europe, Cairo South Africa, uh, Kairos UK and so on. So it's these, but also how it's playing out elsewhere. Um, I think Sabil, Sabil is doing amazing work uh, under the radar often, under first under uh, Naim Atik, now under Omar Harami, uh, the Kumi work, where every week there's a different NGO, uh, faith-based or non-faith-based, secular, uh, active group where people stand in solidarity, doing intersectional uh, advocacy together. And they need more support globally uh, from this. So Kumi would be another one to take a look at. Uh, but the work of Sabil and uh, Kairos Palestine. Uh, Mitri Rahab's amazing theological work uh, out of Bethlehem. So all this and helping people stay and stand the ground. But I think BDS is absolutely essential. And BDS now, we have to hope that we get to the point of sanctions. Uh, that, that is going to be the next step, the next stage, I think. Uh, and I hope the churches and others will help put pressure on governments uh, to move to that next level. Yeah, you know, uh, um, it's, it's one thing. We can wrap our minds around boycott, you know, uh, uh, even divestment. Sanctions has been a harder one to just map wrap our minds around as individuals, it really does involve a community or corporate or political government response, doesn't it? Yeah. Cultural, yeah. cultural. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Boycotts are what individuals and non-governmental organizations and institutions can do, but sanctions come from governments. Yeah. And just read the history on South Africa. And uh, Tom Getman, who's on the line, played a major role when he was working with Senator Hatfield on, on putting the pressure on the Reagan administration who were among the last to concede and embrace sanctions. Yeah. And uh, when Europe and then the US did that, um, you know, it was like uh, things began to fall in place. We're a long ways from that, but I think that is at least one model of how things need to go. The, the subtitle of your one of your previous books, Don, uh, Dying in the Land of Promise, is Palestine and Palestinian Christianity from Pentecost to 2000. You have picked up now in your own language uh, uh, issues from Kairos Palestine and the Cry for Hope. 
you 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 talk about Christian Zionism as a theological heresy that yeah. denies the very history that you have uh, uh, um, written about, and you also say it's not only a heresy, but along with our other Palestinian Christian friends, you you say now is a Kairos moment and most recently a status confessionis for the church. Say yeah. say more about that, will you? Yeah. Um, status confessionis means it's a theological term that was developed by the World Alliance of Reformed Churches that mean you're out of order. Your theology is essentially, without saying it, a heresy. It's in violation of the gospels and traditional theology. And the World Alliance of Reformed Churches declared apartheid was a heresy and that the South African churches who embraced that in the reformed tradition were status confessionis. And you had the famous experience when Ellen Bozak and other pastors walked out on the communion service, and I think it was 1982, and Daryl Myers was a witness to that, and said, we can't take communion here with you all because we can't take communion at home if we're black in a white church. So that is out of order. Now, I think Christian Zionism, I would love to see it move to that place. And I think it's going to take a bit of a journey for many of us to push that uh, in our denominations, but also to, to raise that case so that it could come to a, to a vote. Uh, maybe with the, I, I forget their name, but the World Alliance of Reformed Churches has a new name. That's one place it could happen. It could happen in the World Council of Churches, but there's, there'll be a tremendous counter pressure against doing it uh, because of course the pro-Israel lobby and the Christian Zionists have tremendous power. So uh, I would love to see that happen and it would take powers way beyond me and it would take many years, but I think this is one direction things need to go. I want to talk about, I want you to talk about FOSNA now, now Don, Friends of Sibyl North America. <clears throat> for years, you and FOSNA were synonymous or have been synonymous for us activists of a certain generation. For major conferences held, you know, every year around the country with internationally known scholars and activists and artists. But now there's a, a new generation of leaders who focus more on the intersection between Palestinian liberation and the movement for black lives, indigenous peoples, LGBTQ justice, and other liberation movements. You said uh, in your book that Tarek and Rochelle were able to take FASNA to a place that you weren't able to as much as you tried. So, so say a little bit more about, and, and then you related to uh, 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 Mahmoud Darwish's use of the term Palestine as metaphor. So talk a little bit about FASNA, its, its critical role in the US in raising these issues to light and this transition that's, this necessary transition that's taken place in its mission. Yeah, well, uh, I was national, when, after I left North Park, I was searching around and suddenly uh, the national program director position came available. And uh, so I did that for about five or six years. And I was kind of a transitional leader. Um, we were still doing what FASNA had done for 15 years, taking a lot of delegations to the Middle East, uh, running maybe three, four conferences and moving them around to different regions. And we were evaluating that. They're very costly, they burn people out, and maybe we need to go a different direction. So we tested some ideas. And I remember after a very successful Portland conference, I was in a meeting with Brian McLaren, who key noted as an evangelical justice for Palestine. We just loved it. And Brian said, why don't you guys uh, just organize a, a, a nonviolent direct action uh, in San Antonio at Cornerstone Baptist Church in protest to Christian Zionism. 
we worked on that and tried to do it. And we could not put it together. Don, uh, for, for those on our call who don't know who the pastor of that church was, mention that, would you? <laughs> Reverend John Hagee, uh, who I think everybody knows, really the, uh, he claims to be the founder and the director of, of uh, KUFI, Christians United for Israel, or KUFI. Well, we never pulled that off. But after I left, you know, Rochelle Watson, the tremendous organizer, and Tarek Abouada, who actually just uh, stepped down as national director, and then many others, Jonathan Brenneman now has come on as staff, uh, a Mennonite. They organized a protest at Kufi in July, 2018, that was intersectional. They had Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ folks. Uh, Hispanic, Palestinian, Muslim, Christian, Jewish Voice for Peace, and many others. And they had a direct action, a nonviolent protest at the conference. In fact, when Mike Pence got up to give his keynote address, uh, they were screaming, uh, Christian Zionism is racism. They were held, holding up uh, big banners on chairs. And this is all on video. So they did that protest. Uh, Grayland Hagler was, was part of that too. Uh, so they moved it into this intersectional. And now I'm seeing everything they do has this intersectional that we can support Black Lives Matter and stand with them and they can support Palestine. And the same with every other justice issue. Now Mahmoud Darwish writes about this in his autobiographical journal, Journey, and uh, Presence as Absence. And he talks about how Palestine can be a metaphor of justice bigger than just that territory and just the Palestine issue, but encompass justice for Palestine. So I'm trying to play with this whole idea in my last chapter. How can Palestine be a metaphor where we can stand with other justice journeys and they with us and see a wholesome intersectional justice for all, equality for all, and embrace that kind of theology, activism, and so on. So I'm trying to play with that on both the personal level, but also on the advocacy level. But I haven't figured it out. I'm still writing that chapter. <laughs> we have a question, Don. Uh, I'm gonna just read it right off the chat room here. How do you respond to objections to the recognition by Christian denominations that Israel operate, operates apartheid from the Jordan to the sea, that making such a statement would put the Christian communities in Palestine in substantially greater danger from the Israeli authorities? Well, I, I guess I would just say off the top of my head that uh, it, it has long been an issue of apartheid. It is apartheid from the river to the sea. There's one state that's a Zionist state where Palestinians are subjected in the West Bank uh, and, and East Jerusalem and Jordan to a military set of laws and basically ethnic cleansing. Uh, the Palestinian community is disappearing in that process. And they now are telling us we need to stand up and, and fight this. That same apartheid is inside Israel. And the Beth Selim report yeah. accounts for this in, in clear analysis and detail. But this has been out there for years. But finally, now it's getting traction. So I think this is a case where we need to stand with that. It's, it is apartheid. Use the A word. It's also ethnic cleansing. It's a slow genocide. And I try to weave this in and show how the Christians are calling on us, along with progressive Jews and progressive organizations, to call out uh, you know, the atrocity of what's happening. So I think this is way we can be in solidarity. That's my, that's my answer usually when people talk about BDS. We're being invited by the Palestinian Christians to stand in solidarity and to speak louder than we ever have been than we ever have before. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And I think if we draw from liberation theology, uh, we let the people who are suffering write our agenda. Yeah, we have to adjust it, but we have to go to them and learn where the injustices happen. And, uh, you know, the, the, president, the, the preferential option of the poor and the dispossessed is where we learn our theology and, and learn, get our cues for what we should be doing here. Let me let me follow up on that, Don. I'm, we're we're about wrapping up here. Uh, I want to just uh, um, uh, let people know. So I, I want to wrap up, but I have a couple more questions. You, Jeff Halper, and others have now begun to use the lens. You talk about this of settler colonial analysis from anthropologist Patrick Wolf and others, as you write and speak about Zionism from its very inception. From its very inception. Yes. You say it helps you to, quote, frame the critique of Zionism and Christian Zionism within the context of ethnic cleansing and genocide. And then, Don, your contribution recognizes it theologically as well as politically. So talk about this development in your analysis to this settler colonial analysis. Yeah. Yeah, I've had several uh, different approaches I mean, I started working on Christian Zionism kind of from a biblical, theological, educational model. And, uh, and then began to realize, you know, it's not enough. We need that. We need to expand it. Uh, the website, Christian www.christianzionism.org, is largely an educational uh, instrument to focus on all of these things. But... I think we need to go deeper, as I've been led, to see Zionism uh, from a framework of settler colonialism. And this isn't new. I mean, you can go back to uh, Faya Sayag wrote a book in 1965, a great Palestinian intellectual on settler colonialism. Zionism is settler colonialism. Uh, Maxime Rodinson had a book, I think a year later, a Jewish scholar from the Sorbonne, Israel, a settler colonial uh, whatever state. So this goes back to the 60s and 70s, but now with this whole, um, with what Patrick Wolf and the whole school of anthropology and settler colonialism, it gives us a framework, a lens. And I think in theology, it's happening. And seminaries are doing this uh, you know, to see how the indigenous people have been ethnically cleansed and the Palestinians are among them from the Nakba and even before. And the earliest stages of Zionism and Christian Zionism have embraced uh, a land of no people for a people with no land from Herzl. Well, the antecedent of that goes back to either Lord Shaftbury or a Scottish pastor, Keith, who said the same thing 50 yeah. years before Herzl. Yeah. That is settler colonial ideology, a recipe. Herzl said it boldly. He said, if you want to construct a new home, you may have to destroy the old one and then build on that land. Can you be any clearer than that? Destroy what was here, the indigenous Palestinian people, move them out, transfer them, and replace them. This is what Zionism does. And Christian Zionism provides a theological cover and support for that. So this is where I'm going with my theological analysis of Christian Zionism. And I think you can play this out uh, quite, quite clearly. I want to, uh, we're going to let you close in a few minutes. I have one last question before you close, Don, and that is, how we began last, the first interview. You title your book, Glory to God in the Lowest. And when I asked you about that a couple of weeks ago, you said it's all about the Christian faith, liberation theology, all the rest is about downward mobility. <laughs> uh, and and I'm, I'm thinking that the more I've thought about the interview today and following up with you, I've returned to this to this humble and yet bold title that you chose based in poetry, right? Uh, yeah. 
Uh, talk to us about downroom mobility in the Christian faith and your activism. Yeah, um, well, that's kind of what the book tries to do. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's humbling. We have to humble ourselves so that we listen to the oppressed and then go to them. You know, liberation theology talks about the preferential option of the poor. Um, Paulo Freire frames it that we, we listen and come in solidarity. And I think, uh, you know, the, uh, the small communities studying the Bible with the poor and the theologian and the priest are equal. Everyone is equal in that context. And this is a, a metaphor, but a practical act of downward mobility. And I think we then have to do that in our solidarity work, uh, go to where the suffering is and, and listen, and not just give our Western intellectual analysis of it, but listen to what they are trying to tell you and call us to march in solidarity with. So, and you look at the scriptures, this is what the prophets were doing. This is what Jesus was doing par excellence. I mean, from the cradle, when he's born in a crib, you know, in a cave, and then they become refugees. Jesus' whole life is a model and a symbol of this. And Darwish picks this up. And he talks about this as our solidarity uh, with Palestinians. So I guess I'm saying we, this is kind of not just a metaphor, it's it, it, it's, a, it's a lifestyle, a worldview, a way of life to be in solidarity, to learn and be humble, to be guided by those who are suffering, and then to stand with them and pay the price. I was going to have that be the last question for in, until you closed, but uh, our, our friend, our mutual friend, Fahad Abu Akhl from Atlanta asked Don, you know, it, we're under a new uh, administration in Washington, D.C. And while we're grateful for the new tone and no, you know, the, the, the lack of drama at best, you know, every day and uh, 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 injustice that's been that's inflicted upon us uh, on a regular basis. For those of us in this movement, right, uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have not been friends of the struggle for Palestinian rights. And I said that as diplomatically as I, yeah. I could say it. What, what, what would you charge us with, ministers, uh, activists, lay people on this call, people who are engaged in the resistance and in solidarity with our Palestinian friends? What can we be about? What should we be about in, in our country today? Well, again, um... I, I think we have to have kind of a, a style of uh, suspicion as we look at the administration and not be swept away by the rhetoric and some of the diversionary strategies that we will see on Palestine. Uh, I operate with the assumption that uh, the Biden administration with Blinken and Secretary of State are going to restore some things but turn Palestine into a humanitarian issue. Uh, and we'll talk about a two-state solution, which is dead, it's moribund. So we need to be critical, suspicious of that, and, well, and nudge them, but also work locally. And we've been able, Linda and I have been able to do this with a wonderful new congressman. It took four years, but Marie Newman, uh, we continue to feed things to our new congresswoman here and she's responsive, uh, but she will need to be nudged as well. So I think locally, we might be able to build a groundswell of justice um, for Palestine and not accept this two-state rhetoric the constant delay, constant negotiations that go nowhere. Um, we're going to have to protect and stay on course with BDS, 
down the road, we're going to have to push for sanctions. Uh, but we got to call for an end to the uh, the ethnic cleansing that's going on every day. Uh, what I mean, what the settlers are doing to civilians, the murder. You know, we've got to really be vigil on this. You know, the torture of the of the children and detention, the rape that we just had reported, and this isn't right. new. Yeah, and the medical apartheid. Oh, the medical apartheid. God, you know, it's relentless. So we have to be the voices in this country to, to, to keep the, stay on course and find the organizations that will work for you. They're out there. And somehow the uh, non-governmental organizations have to find a way to work together and highlight the issues we can, we can bring together. And that, that may come. But, but just stay vigilant, stay active, stay suspicious, but listen to what our Palestinian friends are saying on the ground about the critical situation they are, they are in, and we have to be their voices. I'm gonna let Don have the last word, uh, but before I do, let me share this. Next week, Tuesday, March 2nd at 2 p.m. Eastern, we host One Democratic State Between the River and the Sea, It's Time, featuring Dr. Layla Farsak, Chair of the Political Science Department at UMass Boston, and uh, Jeff Halper, uh, ICAD and One Democratic State Campaign. We're gonna get into the nitty gritty of the One Democratic State proposal and the political strategy to implement it. And so we're gonna really be talking specifics next week. And then we'll be hosting a screening of There's a Field, a film exploring the intersection of Black and Palestinian lives. I've been in touch, had some wonderful conversations with the filmmaker, Jen Marlowe, and she'll be joining us after a week where it's uh, uh, for open screening. We'll provide you the Vimeo password and then a joint screening together on Friday, March 19th, followed by uh, an interview with Jen and one of uh, the actors. So we'll hope that you'll be able to join us for those two and that you'll spread the word with your activist friends. So Don, uh, that's coming attractions. Uh, uh, thank you for joining us today. Do you have any parting words for us? Well, just a couple, just a great thanks, Mike, for the wonderful work you and the Indiana Center are doing and uh, I look forward to Jeff's interview. I've read his manuscript and this is a good, really interesting and good book. And he uses settler colonial analysis in it a good bit. Uh, Jonathan Kutab has also written a one state book and uh, that, that's another one people will wanna read. So I think we have to <laughs> educate ourselves and move on that direction. And I guess my parting words are, you know, uh, this is not gonna be a sprint this is going to be a long, long job to justice. And uh, we just got to keep reviving each other and our souls and to stand in solidarity more than ever uh, with the cries we're hearing, uh, you know, from the children, uh, from the ground, uh, from the churches, the Muslims, from Gaza, uh, so that we can bring an end to this. We may not see it in our lifetime, but our children and grandchildren, we have to make sure they do, both here and in Palestine. So thanks for listening. And uh, let's just rev up again. Revive us again, oh Lord. So thanks, Mike. Thanks, Don. Uh, greetings to uh, Linda and for uh, just uh, the witness that you, Don, but the two of you make... Uh, as, as activists in Chicago and around the world. I mentioned last week that uh, Indiana Center uh, for Middle East Peace would not be what it is without Don being a mentor to me and a mentor to us. And for so many of us who have been his friends for many, many, many years uh, who are on this call today. So Don, uh, thank you. We're looking forward to all of you joining us in the next few weeks for our discussion about the one Democratic State, and then our screening and discussion of there's a field on Black and Palestinian lives. Thank you all for joining us today. Thanks, Mike, and thanks to all who tuned in. Thank you, Don.